Let us pray. Father, as I come before you to present that which you have given to me, I pray that you would put your words in my mouth, my heart, and my mind. That I would speak only that which you want me to speak. And so even now, I crave your words, Lord, and whatever explanations you may give to me, and help me to do so humbly and according to your will and your will alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, we will talk about lost and found. Have you ever lost anything? How do you feel when you find it? Uh, some of you, you haven't searched for it, so you didn't get to feel happy. Well, today we're going to Luke chapter 15. And in Luke chapter 15 are some parables. You know, one of the things we learn in business is that word pictures are powerful ways to communicate to individuals, to persons, what you would like them to understand. Well, we did not develop that. Christ started that years ago. What does, what does the Bible call these word pictures? Parables. Parables. So there are three very important parables in the book of Luke, chapter 15, specifically, that we will take a look at. We'll do a little bit of studying today on these. Uh, what were they? What was the first one? The lost sheep. Then there was a lost coin. And then the last one, lost son, right? Some Bibles call it the prodigal son. I prefer to refer to that parable as the lost son. And so I encourage you, I implore you, to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, we will start at verse 3. So Luke chapter 15 and we'll start at verse 3. Sounds like you're still turning. Uh, you know where it is, okay? Matthew, Mark, Luke. There you go. And verse 3 says, And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, if he lose, if he has how many sheep? A hundred sheep and lose one of them, doth not do what? Leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and then do what? Go after that which he lost, and then after a while turn back home. Until he does what? Until he find it. Then the Bible says, and Jesus is speaking here, and when he hath found it, what does he do? He laid on his shoulders, rejoicing. Then when he gets home, he says, and when he cometh home, he does what? Calleth together his friends and neighbors and say what to them? Rejoice with me, for I have done what? I have found my sheep which was lost. Now, I don't want us to miss this, that when he got home, he called together whom? His friends and neighbors. And I would suggest to you that they actually rejoiced with him. You see, when we experience joy in our lives, we hope that our family, our friends, our neighbors would rejoice with us. But oftentimes, unfortunately, that is not the case. Now, Lest we believe Jesus was just talking about sheep, we want to read verse 7. And in verse 7 he says, I say unto you, what does Jesus say unto us? Likewise, joy shall be where? In heaven over one sheep, one sinner that what? Repenteth. More than over 99 just persons which need no repentance. Friends, Jesus used sheep to talk about people. Would the peop 
the people who Jesus was talking to were ta uh, was talking to at the time would they understand this parable? Yes, many of them were shepherds. They have been around sheep. So therefore, if you and I are going to talk to someone, choose a more relevant topic. Right? If I, you know, I, it brings to mind that I believe it's in Songs of Solomon, can't tell you exactly where, that uh, when uh, he's talking about his beloved and talks about how her teeth are like sheep on a mountain. You, you don't go court a young lady telling her her, her teeth are like sheep. And, and she's like dirty woolen sheep. You don't go get anywhere that way. You would have to bring something more relevant, right? So these folks would have known what Jesus was saying. So who were the lost sheep? I suggest to you Jesus is trying to tell us that there are many who once walk with us. For whatever reason, they are lost. The devil may be blocking their way back home. You see, the sheep probably knew it was lost, but couldn't find its way back home. And so what did Jesus say? The shepherd went to find the sheep. See, Jesus is showing us salvation here. When Adam and Eve sinned, did they go looking for God? No. God came looking for them. And so what Jesus is trying to show us is that salvation is this free gift that we get. Jesus doesn't say, repent, and then I will show you how much I love you. What does he do? He shows us how much he loves us and so that that may drive us to repentance. You know, in um, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, supporting these statements, Jesus says, not Jesus, the Bible says, but God commended his love towards whom? Us. That while we were yet sinners, lost sheep, Christ died for us. Friends, too often someone does something to us, and we're like, well, we're not going to forgive them unless they come to us. Unless they come apologize to us. We may not ask them to bow down and kiss our feet, but we want them first to come. How about if we would be Christ-like and approach them? And I go to Allison and say, Allison, uh, and he, now notice how I'm going to say this. Notice I'm not going to say, Allison, I know you sinned against me. No. I go, I say, Allison, you know, I'm missing our relationship. Whatever happened, you know, it didn't go over too well. And I'm just letting you know, the relationship is more important than the foolishness that took place. And so we make the effort. Do you know it's harder for the ones who have transgressed against you to come to you than for you to go to them? Because they sometimes, they know that they're in the wrong. And they're like, man, how do I repair this? And you give them an opening. You go to them. And what I have found in the majority of the case, people will say, Pissard, no, no, it, I was wrong. You know, how is it that you came to me? And you say, that's what God would have me to do. God showed us his love while we were yet his enemies. And all we need to do is repent and turn from our sinful ways. Then the Bible goes on in verse 8 and said, Either what woman had how many coins? Ten pieces of what? Silver. Again, before I go on, if you look in Jewish history, when the woman was married, she was given, that's a normal thing, these ten pieces of silver. So do you think it would have been important to the woman? Yes. The Bible then says, and if she loses one, what does she do? Lights a candle. Now remember, she's in the house. She lights a candle. And then what does she do? Sweep the house. And then what does she do? Seek how? Diligently. And then she gives up. Till she finds it. And when she has found it, 
she calls whom together? Our friends and our neighbors. And what does she say to them? Rejoice with me, for I have done what? I have found the peace which I had lost. Again, friends, lest we think Christ is talking about inanimate things like a coin, he's talking about individuals. He says in verse 10, that there what? Likewise, there is joy where? In the presence of the angels of God. Where are the angels of God? In heaven. Over one sinner that repented. Friends, when someone who once walked with us in the word leaves, and we know they have left, they're out there doing everything they, sh they should not be doing. Instead of judging them, when they come back, we welcome them. I am not saying as soon as they come, we're like, okay, man, you can get back in the pulpit and start preaching. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying we turn over the keys of the treasury to them. I am not saying that. God calls us to be wise. But we welcome them. We show them love. And we, because maybe they're like, you know what? I walked out because those people at that Wesley Chapel Church, they're no good. That's what they thought. Let me go see if it's true. And they come back, and if the greeters fail to do our jobs at the door, then who knows? They may never come back. Now, let's say the greeters, we do our jobs very well, and we bring them in here, and then no one else talks to them. No one invite, even though, and let me say this, even though um, Jim, who normally does the, um, the, the announcements, even though Jim may say about the, the potluck, that's not, an, it's a good general invitation. But we should take the opportunity to invite individuals ourselves. There are times when I'm out there, after, you know, I'm greeting, and so we stay out there. I stay there with Russ, you know, Russ is security, so I kind of play a part-time security guy with him out there. And when people are leaving, as a visitor, I said, hey, are you coming to Potluck? With? And they said, yeah, I'll stay. And so just because they see it on the screen, just because Jim says it doesn't mean they'll stay. But sometimes if, if they get a personal invitation, they will stay. And you could just say to them, I'd like you to join me for potluck. And then please go spend some time with them. Okay, if you're going to have them join you, spend some time with them. So Jesus is talking about those folks who once walked with us. These are the lost coins. They left. No, they're in the house. Those, the sheep left. They're in the house. And they're lost. Do you understand this? They're in the house. Which house? This house. God's house. There are people that come to church Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath, and they're lost. They're hearing sermons. They're visiting um, Sabbath school. They're doing Sabbath school lessons. They hear some very good children's story. They hear singing that is pleasant to God's ears, and they're lost in the house. So what do we do? As God's hands and feet and his mouthpiece, what do we do? Well, let me tell you what we don't do first. We don't go looking at people and say they're lost coins. You cannot, you don't have the ability to do that. So here's what we do as children of God. Notice what the woman did first. What was it that she did first? She lit a candle. You know what that represents? She shed light on the situation. So we ought to shed light to those folks. In Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16, Jesus said to us, Ye are the light of what? The world. What else does he say? A city that is set where? On a hill cannot be hid. But what else? 
Or he that lighted a candle does not put it under where? A bushel. Why would you not put it under a bushel? It goes out. But you put it on a candlestick and then what happens to the house? It gives it light unto all that are in the house. And then he commands us to do something. So he says we are the light. He tells us how we are light. And then he says we ought to do what? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify whom? Your Father which is in heaven. Now, lest we get high-minded and haughty and full of ourselves, we have no light in and of ourselves. So where is this light coming from? It's the light of Jesus. John 8, 12, Jesus says, well, the actual scripture says, Then spake again, uh, spake he again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. Right? He that what? Followeth me shall not walk in what? Darkness, but shall have what? The light of life. So when Jesus says we are the light, he's talking about us reflecting him. So first, before we can be light, we have to have Jesus in us. So when Jesus says we need to shine that light, we are to shine forth whom? His light. That's our responsibility. Not to go judging folks, not to say who is going to be saved, who, who is a coin, who is this or that, but we shine light to everyone. Because you and I do not know who represent that lost coin in the church. And so while we cannot save anyone, we can expose them to the love of Jesus. And through exposing them to Jesus' love, they may turn and repent. Not all will repent. Because unfortunately, think about a coin. A coin cannot necessarily do things of itself. So it needs Jesus to pro, uh, push them towards repenting. But some will do what? They will fight it. And there are some folks who will never be saved because they refuse to do the will of God. It's a hard thing to know that that will happen. But you know what? Not everyone will be saved. But my job and your job is not to worry about that. We need to show forth the love of Christ to everyone. You know, in the book Desire of Ages, page, page 307, paragraph 1, the servant of the Lord expounds to us how we should show forth light. She says, the consistent life, the holy conversation, the unswerving integrity, I want to stop at integrity. Many think that the church of God needs to relax its standards and more people would come in. Maybe it may happen, but then it would no longer be the church of God. It would be the church of Satan. Because then, before you know it, everyone is apostatizing. And so she says again, the consistent life the holy conversation, the unswerving integrity, the active benevolent spirit, the godly example. These are the mediums through which light is conveyed to the world. Do we have a part to play? Yes. The servant of the Lord gave us practical advice. And so I strongly encourage us as we study the word of God, spend some time reading the spirit of prophecy also. Not because it takes over or it's greater than, but it complements the Bible perfectly. I guarantee you that. Then we go to the third and final parable. One we'll spend a little bit more time on. And in verse 11... The Bible says, and he said, a certain man had how many sons? Two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, 
Give me the portion of goods that fall to me. Stop. Every time I think of that in my mind, I said, if I ever said that to my dad, I don't know where I would end up. <laughs> Can you? You, you know, in, in, in Haitian Creole, they would say, fréquent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I like that. In Jamaica, we say they're feisty. But, you know, in America, you're more um, sophisticated. You said they're rude. But it doesn't carry the weight. Now, every time I hear my Haitian family say, you fréquent, I, it just has so much power. And that, how dare you go? It's an inheritance. You go, the, the son goes to the dad. I say, listen, man, I, I, just give me my part. Which your part? It belongs to God. But the son goes and say, give me my portion of goods. And you know, the father is so loving, so kind, so gentle. Says, and he did what? You tell me what he did. Did he get upset? He, he divided it to both of them. It says he's living. So here's the father working all this time, creating a living, living, and he gave it to both of them. Gave it to both of them. Because he says he divided unto them. And then Jesus goes on and says, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together. And what did he do? He took his journey where? Into a far country. And there he invested it wisely. No? He wasted his substance on what type of living? Riotous. Riotous living. He wasted his substance. Everything that this father, well not everything, half of what the father had built up, he wasted it on riotous living. You know, friends, when you and I step away from the word of God, when we step away from God himself, it's as if we are in a far country. You could live down the street and you stop coming to church, you're in a far country. And when we end up in a far country, we end up wasting our substance. In, and I'm not saying it happens immediately, but slowly. We're wasting our substance in riotous living. But God is good. If we go to verse 17, we'll skip through 14, 15, 16. Verse 17 says, and when he did what? He came to himself. Now, lest we think he just came to himself all by himself. Do you know when we were out there, and I've been out there, right? I was out there, came in the church, left, went out, and back in the church. When we're out there, who continues to speak to us? Holy Spirit continues. You know, the Holy Spirit's job is to guide us into all truth. And when we're out there living a lie, the Holy Spirit continues to speak to us, to remind us of the beautiful family we left back in church. And then the devil will say, but you remember that one person who looked at you cross-eyed? And then you forget all the other people and focus on the wrong look. And you didn't realize the person wasn't looking at you cross-eyed. They are cross-eyed. <laughs> they weren't trying to be mean to you. you know? It's just that you never know what happened. That person may have had a headache that day. Um, they may have been thinking about stuff that has been bothering them, and they didn't greet you like they normally greet you. You know, if I will, I have learned this, personal experience at another church, that if I'm not feeling well, you know, especially physically, I step away from the door. Because I was at the door greeting, and I remember at least one person came to me, was Christ-like enough, and she said to me, Bizarre, what happened to you? He didn't greet me well today. And I said, I didn't. Here I am thinking, Carol, I'm doing a great job. But I was not feeling well. And I said, she said, no, no, no. Like, you didn't treat me right. And I said, I am so sorry. I have this headache, and I've been trying to fight through it. I said, oh, I thought you did. I did you something. 
But fortunately, she said that to me, and I believe the way it worked. Either I was speaking the next Sabbath, but I know I was on the rostrum, and I was able to apologize to the entire church. Because the fact that she brought it to me, it was not for me now to say, well, the others should say something to me. No, I must have done similar to the others, so I apologize. And you know it's a good thing I did, because a, a number of other people say, yeah, we were wondering what was wrong with you. <laughs> well, why didn't they say, and I said that, I said, so why didn't you say something? Right? So when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, when we come to ourselves, because he brings us to ourselves, what did this young son do now? He said something. How many hired servants of my father's have what? Bread enough and to spare. And I perish with hunger. Here he is. He's wasted his substance. He's wasted his substance in riotous living. But God didn't get rid of him. Here's God speaking to him, and he came to himself. Unfortunately, there are some folks who do not come to themselves. They want what they want, and it doesn't matter how many times God speaks to them. And sometimes God speaks to them through us. He speaks to their minds through the Holy Spirit. It may be some sign they see that says something that triggers, and they said, no, I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. But fortunately, this gives us hope. He came to himself, and he said that he was going to do what again? What is he going to do? Look, look in the Bible. All right, let's keep. So I will return to my father. And what will he say unto his father? I have sinned against what first? A heaven and before thee. See, whenever we do things that are sinful, the fur, we have to think about God. Do you remember Joseph? Do you remember when that lady tried to get that young fella to do untoward behaviors? We'll put it that way. And Joseph said, how can I do this, commit this great sin against whom? God! We transgress against each other and we sin against God. And so here, this young man says, I will arise. And what will I do? I'll go home. I will say unto him, you know, Father, here, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I'm no longer, now here's humility for us. He says, and I'm no longer what? Worthy to be called thy son. What does he want to? He says, make me a what? A servant. Now this young man remembered how loving his father was. That even the servants had more than they needed. And he was willing to take the position of a servant. That's humility. See, when God brings to our minds that we're sinning, we should go to him Humbly. You know, in Matthew 5, verse 5, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, are the humble. And what is the blessing that the meek will get? They shall inherit the earth. And we're talking about the new earth. Friends, if you and I want to go to heaven and inherit the earth, the new earth, we have to be humble. We have to turn from our sinful ways and go to our Father and say, Father, I know I've sinned. I know I used to be an elder in the church, but all I want to be right now is just a member. Just, just allow me to come back. Allow me to study with my family once again. But did the Father made him into a servant? Let's look at verse 20. Let's look at verse 20. We know that he arose and, you know, okay, but what does verse 20 say? When he was, how far? A great way off. 
not just a ways off, a great way off, what happened? All right. It's, do you think the father was just kind of like strolling around, you know, doing his chores and then he saw him? I suggest to you that every day the father was looking for him. And he recognized he looked skinny, he looked raggedy, hair not combed properly, but he saw his son. And he said, mm hmm well, here he comes now, want some stuff. He had compassion on him. He did not start saying any negative things about him. He had compassion. And then he did something else. He ran. He fell on his neck and he kissed him. Didn't say he took a baby wipe with clean and clean it down. That's my wife right there, you know. She clean you up. You know. I swear sometimes she's going to bleach me down. You know. But my wife, like, you know, we just bought this new house. She's bleaching walls. <laughs> she doesn't play, right? When I walk into a house that we buy, I know, it's clean. But the father, did, he ran. He was just so glad to see his son that he'd been looking mad. Every day he's looking out for his son. And there was the boy. Finally come. He didn't even wait till he ran to him. You know, here in this parable, Jesus is telling us that there are some of us who once walked with us. They have left the church. They're lost. They know they're lost. But they're listening to the Holy Spirit. They're listening and they come back. They know how to find their way home. They're not like the lost sheep that it's like they can't find their way home. And so you and I have to go in the power of God to go bring them home. They're not like the, the lost coin that is already in the house that we need to keep shedding light on. They actually know they belong in the house. And then here I am. Big Christian I am. I see them coming. You know, I see them coming, Allison. And I say, where is he going? He doesn't know he messed up the church five years ago. He wanted to bring his rock and roll music in here. He wanted to bring some funny Bible. Right? Every time he opened his mouth, he sounded like one of those people who are not Seventh-day Adventists. And we look at them. And we're like, where are you going? Instead of welcoming them back home. Friends, we ought to know that Jesus is working on even the people we think are our enemies. And he's going to bring them back into the house. And your responsibility, my responsibility, is to welcome them back with the love of God. And please don't welcome them and be looking at them sideways to see if they're going to do something. We have to treat them like God treats us, like they never did us any wrong. Because friends, let me say to you, if we hold them up in our hearts, we are the ones who are going to be lost. And so this lost son comes and the father welcomes him. And he just doesn't welcome him. What did he do? We know that he made sure he was taken care of. Yes. He made sure he was taken care of. Now let's fast forward to verse 25. And here are the, the son that we're going to look at. He's like some folks in the church. Not all, but some folks in the church. And verse 25 says, Now his elder son was where? In the field. He was out there giving Bible studies. He was visiting the, the, the sick and shut in. He was giving communion, right? He was out there in the field working. And the Bible says, and he came to the house, and, well, and, he, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, what did he hear? A party going on. Now listen, just because the Bible says music and dancing is no justification for you guys to approach Elder Wynne or the pastor and say, oh, we could dance in the church. 
Oh, no, listen, this is a parable, okay? It was just saying they're having a good time in there, a Christian party, okay? And he said, he called one of the servants and asked what that meant. Now, listen to the wise servant. Now, I assure you that based on the reading and the study of this, that chances are this elder brother, as he, you know, I, I'm just postulating, he going about his days, I can't believe that no good brother I have. Leave me here to do all the work by myself. Done, took away half my father's goods. And the servant speaks to him wisely. And he said, Thy whom has come? Thy brother is come. And thy father, notice he didn't leave out any of the, the good facts, right? But he ended the statement wisely. He says, thy brother is come, and thy father has killed what? The fatted calf. But notice what he says, because he has received them home, safe and sound. He's trying to help out the brother. But did you think he heard that received them safe and sound? Oh, no. What? He killed the fatted calf? The calf I had my eye on? And what does it say in the next verse? The brother was what? Happy. Angry. This is a, someone in the house of God. And he was not happy to see the sinner repent and come home. He was angry. Because here's the deal. But when he was here, you know, he, he was Sabbath school superintendent. Now he's going to walk back that position. I'm just telling you how we think. Right? Notice I'm picking on me and my wife. She's the Sabbath school, you know, primary superintendent. Right? He's an elder. Oh, no, he wants, uh, you know, to be one of the elders again. And so we're not thinking that we're so happy that our brother or sister has come home. We're thinking that why are they even here and we're angry with them. And the fact that the servant told him that they killed the, fat, the father killed the fatted calf, it means that the father is so happy. Do you think he would have seen his father sad? Looking out for his son? But he didn't share in that. He's in the house. Is he being exposed to the love of the father every day? Yes. But unfortunately, he did not learn to love like his father. He would not go in. And I'm just going to paraphrase the remainder. He, his father came out, and the Bible said, entreated him, meaning to ask him earnestly. But what does he do? He attacks the brother. Right? He said, you know, all these years I'm doing this. I, and I'm doing that. And I, actually, that verse is very important. Listen to this. I, I, I want to read and, uh, uh, and make sure that we hear where his heart was. Okay? He, uh, 29 says, And answering said to his brother, Lo, these yet many years do I serve thee, neither transgress I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. In one verse, he referred to himself, himself five times. It was all about him. Friends, I really hope there are none of us like that in here. I hope that we are allowing God to rule in our lives so that when our brothers and sisters come back, I have heard that there were many others who once walked with you. I wasn't here then, so I can't say us. That would be a lie. That once walked with you, and they have left. Be not surprised, my friends, that they come back to us. And when they do, let us be ready to welcome them back in love. Let us Treat them as if nothing ever happened negative. Let us be like Romans 5, 8, 
where the Bible says, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let us love them back into the fold. But be very careful. Be careful that sometimes folks will come back to create issues. You are not here to predetermine that. But as wise Christians, if someone comes back and starts gossiping, you cut that off immediately. Amen. We are called, and we're going to do so in a very nice way. Because people sometimes will return. And the first thing is to start saying negative things. You try and guide them to the positive. Please, a young, uh, a young lady uh, at, at my work, I very, used to be very negative, but I've seen, a, and I never make um, New Year's resolutions. As soon as God shows me something wrong in my life, I've been blessed to be able to ask him to help me to get rid of that. I never wait for New Year's. Who say you're going to live to a New Year? And, but that's her resolution. You know, I'm not telling her that anything's wrong, but she has asked me to help her to be positive. And so the same way when folks come in here, whether they came and left or they're just coming in, as soon as you start hearing positive and negative things, help point them to the positive side. There's always a positive. Let us not be like the big brother, the elder brother. Now, I can't tell you that he never repented because the Bible does not say that. But here's something he forgot. Look at verse 31. The father says, And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me. And how much? All that I have is thine. Do you remember when the father split it? Did he say he, keep, he kept any part for himself? No, he said he divided among them. The one brother got one, and the other brother got now, the father was living there, but he says, and all that I have is thine. And verse 32 says, it was meat, and meat doesn't mean meat, right? It was necessary. That's what that word meat means. It was necessary that we should make merry and be glad for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Friends, I say to you, we have people who fall into one of these three categories. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. It may be us. And so what I would ask you to do, you know, when the pastor asked me to fill in for him, and God put this on my heart, the first thing I did after reading these scripture was evaluate myself. We ought to evaluate ourselves first. And the way we evaluate ourselves is to ask the Holy Spirit to show us because you can't see it. Show us where do we fall within those three parables. Are we the lost sheep? Are we the lost coin? But it doesn't matter. There's hope for us. Both the lost sheep and the lost coin were found. Are we the lost son? And there are two sons that were lost in this situation. One left and then came back. But one, like the coin, was still in the house. Because that behavior is not the behavior of someone that is saved. And so when we look, be honest with God because he knows the truth. And when you pray like I have prayed this prayer a number of times, I say, God, show me where I am. And it's not for you to know where I am, just like it's not for, you, for me to know where you are. That's between you and God. And then when he shows to you where you are, ask him to give you the power and the strength to be an overcomer. Ask him to help you to move from the lost stage to the found stage.
Father, I came, I spoke the words I believe you gave unto me. I ask of you now, Lord, to forgive me for anything I might have said that I shouldn't have. And remove it from our hearts and our minds, because I know you can do that. And place into us that which I, I should have said. In Jesus' name, amen.